Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. Love thrives on good communication. It can take many forms, but what happens when you suddenly lose what was once your primary means of communication? Jameson Hill's essay, Love Means Never Having to Say Anything, takes up that question. It's read by Pedro Pascal. He plays Oberyn Martell in Game of Thrones and Javier Peña in Narcos. He's starring now in King Lear on Broadway and in the new Netflix movie, Triple Frontier. After dating Shannon for several months, I needed to say something to her, but I couldn't. It's not that I was nervous or unsure of the phrasing. It's that I couldn't speak. My lungs and larynx couldn't create the air pressure and vibrations needed to say the words floating around in my mind. This is our reality. I can't talk to Shannon about anything, not the weather or her day or how beautiful she is. Worst of all, I can't tell her that I love her. This was never a problem in my previous relationships with women I thought I loved, or perhaps didn't love at all. These women knew my voice. They heard it every day. But they never knew what I was actually thinking. They never knew how miserable my body felt because, back then, I was able to function at a relatively normal level and hide my illness well enough to seem healthy. I could go on dates, talk on the phone, and even drive to my girlfriend's house to spend the night. But over time, my condition worsened. Lyme disease had exacerbated my existing case of myalgic encephalomyelitis an inflammatory multi-system disease that can leave patients unable to speak or eat for years at a time. I'm now 29 and have been sick for eight years, the last three of which I have spent bedridden, mostly speechless and unable to eat solid food. I used to be a bodybuilder who worked out for hours every day and I was blindsided by the rapid deterioration of my health. I couldn't care for myself. I had to delay love and many other things while I waited for my health to stabilize. That's when Shannon came into my life. She lives in Ottawa, about 2,000 miles from my house in California. We met online, which is common, But otherwise, our relationship has no precedent or guide. We are two people very much in love, but also very sick. Shannon has the same condition I do. She has been sick longer since adolescence, but thankfully has never lost her ability to speak. Instead, she struggles with unrelenting nausea and has trouble digesting food. She is often malnourished, and her weight drops below 100 pounds, too thin for someone 5 foot 5 inches tall. We both have low blood volume, which makes it difficult for her to walk without fainting and impossible for me to sit up in bed without intense pain and weakness. Since I am bedridden, The only way we can be together is for her to travel across the continent to see me. But even with her willingness to jeopardize her health by traveling so far, we are often away from each other for months at a time. When we are together, we spend weeks in bed, mostly holding each other, 
our bodies aligned like two pieces of a broken plate glued back together. Because I can't speak, we often resort to communicating by text messages while cuddling in bed. It's like a month-long sleepover and feels surreal. Being stuck in a situation so miserable that it could make your skin crawl. But finding comfort knowing that your soulmate is next to you, going through something similar. But our experiences differ. Shannon can briefly get up to use the toilet, bathe, and, on a good day, make herself a meal. I, on the other hand, have to do everything in bed. Brush my teeth, bathe, and use the bathroom. A plastic bag for bowel movements and for urinating, a dubious-looking plastic container attached to a tube feeding into a bucket on the floor. These are not sexy things, but are a part of life. My life and ours together. I was embarrassed at first to ask Shannon to avert her eyes and try not to think of me urinating inches from where we had been kissing just seconds earlier. But I have since come to realize that it's all part of sharing our lives. It may be far from the bedroom romps we had experienced before getting sick, but knowing that nothing about my bedridden life makes Shannon uncomfortable endears me to her. In contrast, I've had relationships with women who became upset at the first sight of anything inconvenient. One girlfriend who threatened to break up with me because she thought my beard trimmings were clogging the bathroom sink, and another who blamed our problems on my insomnia. These failed romances remind me of the baffling incompatibilities two people can have, but also how love can transcend even the most insurmountable obstacles when you find the right person. Before we started our relationship, when we were just two friends with the same illness texting for hours, I asked Shannon, do you think two sick people can be together? Yes, she replied. I think when you're both sick, it makes it easier and harder at the same time. I guess the downside, I said, is there's no healthy person to take care of you. But when you're alone, there's no healthy person to take care of you either, she said. I had never thought about it like that. The possibility of two sick people being in a successful relationship together. I've always assumed that one person in the couple would need to be healthy. Two sick people can't take care of each other. <laughs> But Shannon and I take care of each other in ways I never thought possible. I may not be able to make a meal for her, but I can have takeout delivered. And she may not be able to be my caregiver, but she can post an ad looking for one. We have done these things and many others for each other from opposite ends of North America. We share an empathy that only two people with the same condition can feel. We know what the other person is going through on bad days. We know how exasperating it is to explain invisible symptoms to doctors only to face skepticism. And we know all too well what it's like to be immobile in an ever-moving world. Even so, we don't know everything about each other. We don't know what we're like as healthy people. We don't know what differences lie between our current selves and the people we were before getting sick, what maturation and emotional hardening have occurred during that transformation. Most fundamentally, we don't know what it's like to have a vocal conversation with each other. Shannon has never heard my voice. She has never heard me berate a telemarketer or mumble to myself after making a typo. She has never heard me mess up a dinner toast or tell a corny joke. She has never heard me whisper into her ear or come up with a witty reply. She has never heard me ask a question or speak my mind to anyone. 
and she may never get to hear me do any of these things, but that's okay. Here is this lovely woman, devoid of judgment, who loves me for the words I type to her on my phone. I never loved any of my previous girlfriends the way I love Shannon. I wanted to tell her how much her companionship means to me. I had tried before many times without success. Still, I felt I had to try again. Somehow, I had to convey, without typing, what I was feeling. My text messages were inadequate, and I thought about using hand signals, but the heart-shaped hand gesture felt far too cliched. So I tried to use my voice. To my surprise, for the first time in months, I heard actual sounds coming from my mouth. With my jaw locked, I whispered through clenched teeth, I love you. What? She said, startled. I took a deep breath and fought back the nearly unbearable pain in my throat and jaw. Tears began to well up in my eyes. I whispered again, this time using all the strength I had. I love you. Oh, sweetheart, she said. I'm so sorry, I don't know what you're saying. I wasn't sure what was worse. The emotional torment of not being able to speak, or the physical pain of trying. After everything I had been through, the months of struggling to stay alive in my sickbed, and finally finding the love of my life, I couldn't tell Shannon that I loved her. Lucky for me, I didn't have to. As if straight from a heart-wrenching scene in Love Story, Shannon took my hand, gave me a soft kiss and said, you don't have to say anything. I love you. Now, months later, it still holds true. For us, love means never having to say anything. That's Pedro Pascal reading Jameson Hill's essay, Love Means Never Having to Say Anything. We've got more after the break. Jameson is still sick, but now, about a year after his piece came out, he's able to speak in a whisper. My health is better in some ways, and probably worse in other ways. If you're able to hear this, then that's an improvement. But I would say in other ways, like, I'm I'm less mobile. I haven't been able to get around in a wheelchair as much, so there's kind of a give and a take. Jameson's symptoms vary from day to day. He says there's a lot of pain in his muscles and joints, and speaking is painful and exhausting. He also suffers from nausea and weakness, and he says doctors haven't been able to give him an accurate prognosis. I think the scariest part is just how unpredictable it is. As an example, like two years ago, I couldn't even sit up and eat food on my own. And, you know, two years from now, I could be walking around and taking care of myself again. That's anybody's guess. Jameson and Shannon are still in a relationship, but it's complicated. We love each other. In some ways, we're closer now than we've ever been. We text throughout the day, 
every night I call her and I text and she talks, sometimes I'll whisper. The sad part is we haven't seen each other in a year and a half. She's gotten sicker, so she can't travel, and I can't travel, so we're sort of stuck on opposite ends of North America. And he says they'd like to live together someday. I think we're both confident that that would go well, but it just feels so unattainable, I guess, right now. Ideally, we'd both be better and just have a normal life together. That would just be the greatest thing. Jameson Hill. He's written a memoir and is looking for a publisher. He lives in California. More after the break. Dan Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for The New York Times, says that Jameson's relationship with Shannon made him think about communication and the way it's changing. You know, they communicate electronically when they're apart, but then when they're together, because you can't speak, they continue to communicate electronically and text each other while being in the same bed together. And there was something in that that is sort of echoed with a lot of relationships today, especially among young people who sit next to each other on the couch and text each other and or sit next to each other at work and communicate on Slack, even though the person is right next to them. I mean, I think as a society, we're changing toward electronic communication in a way that is making speech and personal interaction more difficult for everyone. So this was not an intention of Jameson's to make that connection, but I think it's it's almost an inevitable connection um, and is a little bit strangely symbolic of a society that is turning, you know, away from spoken communication and spoken intimacy to electronic communication and electronic intimacy. And here's Pedro Pascal. I chose this essay because um, it is incredibly inspiring and humbling to read and to know of his and Shannon's experience. I think that um, today and maybe um, my entire life relationships seem so impossible because of such ridiculous incompatibilities. I mean, people can break up over disagreeing about a Game of Thrones episode. (laughs) And um, and here... uh, you realize that, you know, nothing is insurmountable and that finding the right person um, can mean a love that, 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 that conquers all. And, and that's very inspiring. Thanks again to Pedro Pascal for reading this week's piece. You can see him in King Lear on Broadway and in Triple Frontier on Netflix. Next week, Sarah Goldberg. After my mother was told she had incurable cancer, she became obsessed with finding me a husband. One afternoon from her office, between negotiations for a client's book contract, she called three times to tell me about a man my father had met who worked in a Soho lamp store. My mother, a powerful publisher and literary agent who had championed Stephen King, now wanted to set me up with someone who sold lamps. He's leaving for France soon, she said. Call him. Modern Love is a production of the New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Caitlin O'Keefe. Original scoring and sound design by Matt Reed. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. Special thanks to Samantha Hennig, Anya Stremian, and Mia Lee at the New York Times. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. You can find resources connected to myalgic encephalomyelitis on our website, wbur.org slash modernlove. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week.